Hello, how are you guys? Hey, uh, I'd like to start off uh, by welcoming you all, and uh, I'll just give you a, a brief introduction about the today's uh, uh, about this, this session. So, my name is Mustafa Yoldash, and uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, an application that I'm building, which is called Oculus, and uh, which is a sort of a handy little application for uh, data visualization or uh, for visualizing uh, graphs. And uh, I'll also like to share with, uh, with you uh, my, my, my current background. So basically, I'm a PhD candidate or PhD student at uh, uh, La Trobe University. Um, I'm, this is pretty much my final year, and uh, I'm doing a research into, into uh, computer science. And uh, I'm pretty much involved with uh, computer graphics and visualization research. This involves doing a lot of uh, two two dimensional and three dimensional data projection and visualization and yeah of course if you have any questions later on after the talk please feel free uh, feel, feel free to contact me later on and I'm also a full time uh, lecturer at the Omar Khor University and this is uh, in uh, kingdom, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and uh, basically I do have a scholarship to finish my my current PhDs at uh, PhD uh, uh, candidature at uh, La Trobe University and soon afterwards I'll be uh, heading, uh, heading back home to uh, Mecca, Saudi Arabia, where uh, I'll basically uh, pr pursue my uh, uh, academic duties there. Okay, and uh, I'm also an Apple certified professional. Uh, I got certified last year, and uh, yeah, uh, got a little, a little bit of training, and yeah, so yeah, um, Mac systems rock. Okay, so I'd like to, just before I talk about Oculus, I'd like to share with you my current workspace. And I've actually been working on a couple of applications, and, uh, and they are actually in the App Store at the moment. So one of them is called Melbourne Portal, and it's ba basically uh, sort of a social application that, that connects different students or overseas students, uh, typically in, uh, from the students from Saudi Arabia. And uh, the objective is to uh, pretty much uh, uh, bring everything from uh, every, uh, every single social media to we, uh, web server to uh, so web service to uh, all, all the other all sort of services that exist out there uh, that uh, involve uh, all the, the Saudi students here in Melbourne and in the uh, typically in Melbourne and in some cases in Australia and for in general and to bring those and host those services into one place into one application and that's uh, where this whole idea came from and yeah uh, it took me quite uh, approximately two months just to finish this project and it's a, it's a complete success and soon afterwards, I uh, was contacted by the uh, Saudi embassy to actually uh, do something uh, uh, more large, uh, large scale. And this is a project that has been finished in 10 days, and it, which is the Saudi Culture or SACM project. And this is an application that, uh, that is, pr is pretty much uh, related to all the activities and everything that, uh, that is affiliated to the uh, Royal, Saudi Royal, Royal Embassy in, uh, in Canberra. And they've held this sort of a competition for us developers, and should we uh, finalize a uh, final demo and uh, show them uh, all the cap capabilities of this application. And uh, yeah, I've uh, basically f finished this project, and uh, within a day or two, I should be uh, awaiting the, the rest of the response and hopefully uh, try to win. So I'll give you a screenshot. So basically, this uh, project does not uh, just involve iOS. It also involves uh, Android. So, uh, so now I'm finished with, uh, with the iOS version. Uh, hopefully, I'm going to start working on the Android version as well. So here's just a screenshot of uh, the uh, location-based services. And both applications, which I also forgot, are uh, mainly uh, designed for Arabic users. So uh, Arabic is the only ma mainstream language uh, that, that is uh, uh, the, uh, like these applications are built, up, uh, built up, uh, on top of one. And of course, my third major application, which is Oculus, or uh, in, in the Latin language, it means I. So the idea came forth into building something simple that would uh, make the, uh, the stages of uh, data projection into, uh, and visualization more in intuitive. So. I'll just uh, give you a, a screenshot of the application. Uh, this is a previous or a really old uh, version of the of the, the, the project. I've been re rewriting this uh, whole project from, from scratch a couple of times, and now it's reached to a stage where I'm pretty much ready to uh, scale things up a little bit. So uh, today's agenda is going to be uh, uh, I'm going to be pretty much dealing with four ma uh, major topics, and I'm going to start by giving you an overview of the of the project. And then, uh, after I finish ex explaining the stage, I'll be 
explaining more into detail about graph theory. Are you guys uh, from the computer science or IT background, or is anybody here who's not an IT person? So do you have uh, the understanding of data structures and all the simple stuff in IT? Perfect. So, okay, if, if not, please raise your hand. Are you okay? Oh, no, there's no more problem. So everything will be covered here. So I'm going to be spending a lot of time here, as well as, as the source code and the inner workings of the application. Third uh, section will be uh, uh, graphics, the graphics API. Uh, so that's where I'll, uh, I'll talk briefly about uh, OpenGL, OpenGL ES uh, 2.0, and GLKit. And these are the mainstream libraries that I use for, for making uh, all the pretty pictures, like all the drawings on screen and all the animations that, that are on the iPad. Um, and also how uh, I was able to build uh, the, the whole uh, or link between the graphs uh, API to uh, with the uh, with the uh, OpenGL and GLKit APIs and just uh, basically come up with uh, the interesting drawings. Uh, final thing which was uh, of interest to me was uh, CSV parsing, and that is uh, I had to have a, a source of uh, like for example data sets that, that I had to read, that, like uh, make Oculus read uh, different file formats. So I chose a CSV. A file format. So basically, so uh, I would en enable the application to read data sets and also write uh, CSV formats, and as, as well as other, other file formats. So let's get started. I'll just give you a brief uh, overview about the project. So uh, a couple of years ago, I was really inspired by uh, doing a little bit of research about this application, which is called Molecules. It's available free as well as source code online by Dr. Brad Larson. I've also had the honor last year in WWDC and actually meeting with him in person, and also had, uh, had a chat with him, and, and, and he kind of uh, gave me his uh, insight into f future uh, plans for, for, for molecules, as well as how he was able to achieve something that was, that was really kind of remarkable. I'll, I'll show you a, a couple of screenshots. So basically, it involves doing a lot of uh, analysis or data analysis, uh, like in, in the form of molecules, uh, more chemical structures, and so forth, uh, mostly in 3D. So, uh, thankfully, the source code was online, so I had some time to uh, uh, try to understand the code and uh, spoke with uh, Dr. Brad. And yeah, that's where I got uh, interested in actually making something similar, but uh, at, at the same time, something that will also work as uh, an aid to my, to my current research at La Trobe University. So here's another screenshot of a couple of molecules, so a couple of data sets that uh, the application can read. And well, what I intend to do is basically uh, come up with an idea. Uh, that was a couple, of, a couple of years ago, I mean, approximately two or three years ago, where, okay, why, for example, why can't I just use MATLAB or any other existing uh, uh, sophisticated package that would just enable me to visualize data or uh, do some pre or post analysis? Uh, well, basically, the answer was no, because I needed something that would allow me to go beyond the the basic sort of routine, so also to basically uh, uh, provide the user, the researcher, the ability to, to explore the data sets in 2D and in 3D in different views, in, in, uh, in different ways that, that weren't possible, uh, that aren't really possible by using a conventional software, like for example MATLAB, if you're familiar with MATLAB and, uh, or SPSS or any sort of statistical uh, software package. So I came up with the idea, and I kind of wrote down the, uh, the PDS, or the uh, Basically, when you, uh, when you write an application, you, uh, the first thing that you ever think of is, uh, and that will speed up the, the process of making a project co come to life, and that is writing a PDS, or an application development state, uh, statement. So it's basically just a handy little, little application or uh, uh, tool that will enable so uh, scientists or researchers or anybody, anybody who is interested in data visualization, uh, scientific visualization or information visualization in that sense uh, to uh, in, uh, enable to, uh, them to explore and interact with the data in a more intuitive fashion. So, yeah. Uh, so that's what was the PDS. And I kind of targeted this application to be something that a little bit serious, not too serious, but as a tool for researchers as well as um, uh, for scientists or anybody who's interested in, in visualization in general. So, okay. Uh, so that just briefly, uh, that is uh, basically, uh, briefly the uh, project overview. And I'm going to be spending most of the talk now uh, uh, expressing graph theory. But uh, since you guys are uh, expert in it or have an, uh, kind of an understanding of graph theory, uh, does anybody uh, of you who hasn't really under, uh, taken any course or read about graphs in, uh, before, or are you completely new to graphs? 
Okay, so I guess I'm going to be kind of skipping some some uh, segments, uh, but just in case if any anybody actually sees this, so uh, I'll be trying to cover all the basics that form uh, the, the the foundation blocks of Oculus itself. So I'm gonna, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about ba the basics about graph and graphs and gra the graph theory in general and how I was able to implement uh, graphs. And also, the most important thing was traversals and how to search through uh, different graphs, different paths within, uh, within a graph, uh, regardless if it was a digraph or directed graph or just a normal graph without any uh, errors. So, yeah. I highly recommend this book. Uh, that was a couple of years ago when I first started uh, doing a little bit of research about uh, graph theory and how I, I would uh, basically establish the foundation of uh, building graphs. I uh, came across this book, which is uh, pretty fascinating, and uh, uh, even though it's, uh, it's a 2002 edition, but uh, the author has uh, uh, done really something really, really, really remarkable, and that is uh, uh, he's provided a lot of different source code and illustrations that are really straightforward, as well as for uh, an actual implementation of all the samples within the book in Objective-C. So that's made me... Uh, uh, rebuild the ground, uh, the ground of, of the foundation of Oculus again within uh, within a month. So I did have a version of Oculus that was that was working, but with a couple of uh, limitations, I wasn't really able to traverse certain graphs from different nodes. But uh, uh, since I've actually found the uh, an existing illustration, uh, yeah, I've actually learned a lot from it, and I'm, I'm adopting the uh, the key features from. Uh, from the from uh, from, uh, from the implementation into onto uh, the current version of Oculus. So, as you are pretty much aware of, uh, the graphs uh, that uh, it's a study of the mathematical structures and uh, that will represent, for example, nodes, uh, objects, and as well as parallel distances or, for example, edges uh, or lines that that would uh, ultimately connect these nodes. Okay, so we will start off by something simple. Uh, uh, a definition of a directed graph or a digraph uh, is basically uh, a notation of having a graph G uh, and that, uh, which comprises of a bunch of nodes and, uh, uh, and edges as well. So you would, uh, any, any sort of digraph or, uh, would normally uh, uh, contain an ordered set of N and E. So what are these? Uh, N would basically represent the, the nodes of the graph or points, if you may will. And of course, they have to be, uh, the graph has to uh, obtain a non-empty set. Without any nodes, a graph cannot be established. Okay, and the second component is E, with, uh, uh, defined on as E, and it will basically represent all the, uh, the relationship between, or the connections be between all those, all those nodes. Okay, so and these are also called the elements of, of the, uh, the graph. Okay, so here's just a simple example of a graph, or a digraph. As you can see, it, you can establish uh, between each node, from, for example, from A to B or to C, uh, with direct lines uh, ending up with arrows, and these are digraphs. And of course, the opposite, which is uh, an undirected graph, will be covered, covered later on, will have those uh, directions. So, okay, so imagine yourself constructing a digraph. Uh, each element is called a node, straightforward, and it's a set of uh, nodes, as I uh, mentioned before, and edges as well. And of course, you have the, the notion of having a head and a tail. So, what are these elements? And of course, these are nodes, but you would distinguish between a head and a tail. A head basically is something that, that is found by the uh, at the end of the arrow, and of course. Uh, the, the beginning part of, uh, of an edge will be, will be called tail. From, so from now on, I'm going to be using the, this, this notation uh, to express uh, most of the uh, content with, uh, that relates to, to graphs. So, okay, having head and a tail. Okay, so the simple notation would be edge E equals uh, T comma H. And that, that sort of format, if it's uh, like that, then it will basically say you, you would have an edge that would uh, emanate from the head and will end up, or in the, uh, end up uh, at a certain tail. So if you want to collect all those uh, uh, list, a set of those uh, edges that, that, are, that would emanate from a particular uh, node, uh, then yes, you would say, uh, for example, you say ha uh, a set, group set A, uh, that, that would uh, emanate to, uh, from, from a tail, so basically, this is the mathematical uh, notation, just to, just to express it, and that's from the book as well. Um, yeah. 
and also have the art degree. I'm going to skip those, not that relevant so far. Of course, the, you have emanating, uh, emanating uh, edges that would emanate from a, a given uh, uh, tail, and you also have edges that would insert it on any given uh, uh, head. Okay, here's uh, the, the same graph that Jess you saw earlier. So I'll just give you uh, an, over, uh, an illustration of how this, this can be applied. So you can, for example, th throughout each node, you can have a group, uh, a set of uh, emanating uh, edges from any node, and you can you can uh, collect these. I can just basically uh, apply a simple graph uh, uh, rules, and you can basically end up having from the from the illustration. Uh, a group of a set of all the nodes uh, and edges connecting between each every, every, every single node. So yeah, so these are emanating and inserted edges, uh, the edge sets from the the digraph. So skip that. Uh, one important thing that uh, also important to, to to the current research and development, which is a path, and a path is uh, from uh, the digraph as mentioned before, represents. Uh, for example, a non uh, uh, a non empty sequence between a starting node or a root node to the the ending node. So I'll explain that a little bit for further into detail. Of course, you have the length. So you, you would, for example, calculate the, uh, the the total distance between the first node and the last node, and that will basically represent the uh, length of the path. Okay, let's consider that just as an, just an example. Uh, you would have basically a successor and a predecessor for each for each node. If you would consider any particular path, so, okay. I'm going to skip that. And sometimes you can get into an occasion where you can find cycles within a graph. We will have, for example, an ending loop of uh, a non-stopping loop uh, within within a graph, and th that will basically ca cause problems sometimes if you want to iterate through a graph and you want to indicate, for example, the shortest path from one node to another node without going through cycles and then having to run into uh, such problems. Okay, and to uh, another uh, way of expressing a uh, 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 graph that are, that are not cyclic, uh, and that is using the, the key definition of acyclic. Acyclic, the digraphs that, are, uh, that don't have any, uh, any sort of loops uh, that would just go on and on. And for example, all trees yeah, also have a data structure, which is called trees. Pretty much uh, uh, all of you know, know a, a little bit more about trees. So trees are also considered acyclic digraphs. However, it's not the other way around. You can have, uh, you, do, you may not have acyclic, uh, acyclic uh, digraphs that, are, that aren't trees. Okay, so I'll give, give you a couple of just examples just to continue on. So this is just a, a, a graph Lay it out into some sort of tree format. Starts from node A and goes down from two different paths, B or C, and so forth. And here's another one. Okay, so we've seen a couple of examples, a couple of stuff that relate to digraphs. Of course, graphs or no or undirected graphs are all pretty much as straightforward. So just a few key differences. So. Yeah. However, uh, the thing to, to note is that within the edge set, uh, you, would, you pretty much have distinct uh, nodes for that would represent uh, the, uh, the the edge, the, edge, the uh, edge set of any of uh, an undirected graph. So here's just an illustration to explain how what a digraph looks like. Okay. Simple terminology. I'm going to skip that. Uh, the most important thing to note, note about the slide is that the uh, set of edges incident on any particular head will be have to be exact, the exact number, the, the exact sort of, sort of formation. So, the uh, the inserted set of uh, the, uh, the that are on the the, the head has to uh, equal the the same number, the same amount that that would you, you would normally have when you uh, when you have uh, when you have the result of the uh, uh, invoke the uh, all the emanating uh, edges from any any particular head. I actually have a typo there. I think it's a tail. So anyway, I'll fix it later on. Okay, and we also have weighted graphs. So, uh, for example, you can associate labels or weights to either a node by itself or to the relationship or to the edge itself to uh, on a graph. So, I'll just show you an illustration. You can associate. Um, 
a label or weight, or a cost factor, for example, uh, on that node. So, for example, if you visit a node in a graph, uh, you can uh, uh, pretty much invoke its uh, its current measure, um, like how much uh, will, will it cost to uh, visit that node, and, and so forth. So you can just uh, pretty much imagine uh, uh, different uh, applications to that. And I use a lot this this uh, this sort of formation in Oculus, and that is to estimate the cost factor or the weight. That would normally uh, that is normally associated between traveling from uh, one key point or one node to another node. Okay, representing graphs, uh, there are two uh, main um, ways uh, that, that are mentioned within the literature to to express uh, graphs and uh, of course links between or paths between uh, uh, each each and every, every single node, and that is having an adjacency matrix and an adjacency list. I use uh, an adjacency list uh, within Oculus, and the reason why because I'm actually dealing de dealing a lot with undirected graphs uh, compared to directed graphs. And with visualizations, uh, I only draw so at the current stage only undirected graphs. So the current research only involves th those types of graphs. In the future, I may uh, uh, do a little bit of research and enhance the application to enable uh, users to draw. Uh, Graphs with different arrows and different other notations, and so forth. So, okay. So it all comes down into the uh, idea of having a link link list, linking between a node and its neighboring uh, and its neighbor, and so forth. So I'll give you an illustration to just explain things. Um, okay. Uh, going back to the, that previous example you saw early on, you start from A and you can establish a, a direction from A to B. You can have a loop between A and uh, C and going, and going back, and then you end up at D. So here's what a linked list would look like with a digraph just like that. You have four uh, linked lists, uh, starting with uh, the first uh, list, starting from A to B to C, and then uh, a, t a terminator, which is uh, an, a nil uh, indicator. And you can uh, have a second and third and fourth. So this is an example uh, that is associated with a digraph. And with uh, an undirected graph, here is what the uh, link list would look like. So you can pretty much have uh, a list containing all the connections, starting from A to B and C and so forth. So just a minor, minor difference. You can do a little, of course, a little bit of research about uh, how linked lists can be used and uh, if, you're, if you're new to data structures in general. Anyway. Okay, and the most uh, a key factor within uh, uh, applying different techniques and algorithms, and what makes Oculus shine at the, at the current stage is having the ability to actually traverse or, or uh, search or move from a point to another point. And you can just imagine what sort of um, uh, f uh, I mean applications, what's, what's, uh, how, like features you can actually apply to the uh, the application to enable uh, researchers and scientists or anybody who is interested to you know, gain power over a particular case study or something. So traversals is a really powerful thing to, to also note down. Uh, and that is also having uh, to search within graph and basically systematically visit all the nodes within a graph looking for any particular goal, goal node. I'll just give you some illustrations. So I'll be using this a lot now. Uh, this uh, sort of example. So you have some sort of almost dense graph that starts from A and then goes downward. That also looks, looks like a tree. So, uh, for example, let's say if you want to look for either N or J. And let's say if you want to... So you, you want to set the goal node to be either N or J. At some cases, you only want to... You want the shortest path or the minimum path possible uh, out, of the, out of that graph. So you would end up having to, to visit, for example, N and then if you want to uh, seek the longest path or you want to continue on and you want to see how can you reach uh, to a node J, then yeah, then these are basically options. So you start off by sele uh, selecting a root node, starting node, and then you would traverse forward. So here's just an illustration. So you would normally select N or J as the goal nodes. So there are two main methods for impl uh, implementing uh, the basic traversals and that, that are uh, a breadth for, uh, first traversal uh, or breadth, uh, breadth order search and uh, a depth uh, first traversal. So I'll explain both now quickly. So a DFT or a depth first tra traversal a technique uh, basically explores a graph, uh, a, a path uh, uh, 
uh, all, all the way to the leaf node that, uh, that you've uh, set as, as, a, as a target, and then actually performs a backtracking routine. So I'll just explain this uh, sort of uh, uh, in, uh, with, with this animation. So you start off by, uh, by, for example, selecting A as a starting node, continue da uh, downwards uh, by, by depth. You start by A, you traverse to B, and then D, and then you would end up uh, into a dead end, and then if you have to, you have to perform the backtrack. And then move to E, and then you also yeah, backtrack and then try path B. Okay, H, L, M, and then voila, you got uh, reached the, uh, the 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 initial target. However, if you want to continue on, if you, you want to make the uh, search can you continue on until you can reach the final node, you can still do that. So, yeah, you can follow with the animation and see where it's going to lead. Of course, you can at this stage you can find J. And you can continue on, you can traverse all the nodes within that graph. So that's a DFT. So that's just a simple pseudocode that you, can, that you may find on Wikipedia or any books. Just explain the basic routine. Uh, compare that to the other uh, famous technique, which is a BFT, or breadth search uh, traversal technique. And you would normally select a root, also before you, were, uh, you would expand. And yeah. So it basically is associated with ne nearest neighbors. So it begins with the root and inspects all the neighboring uh, nodes. And I'll just show you the illustration. And of course, it uses the, uh, a queue data structure uh, compared to a list. Uh, the, the current implement implementation of Oculus uh, utilizes a, uh, something called a queue and a, pri a priority queue. So uh, with the depth, uh, depth order traversal, I use a queue and a priority queue to for example, DQ or extract a minimum value or a maximum value and so forth. So here's a simple illustration if you don't know what a Q is, if you've ever not heard about it. So. You get the idea? So, okay, I really hope like uh, at lectures so somebody can you know do a lot of animations and kind of cool stuff to try to explain something that's hard and doing class. Anyway, so back to that same graph uh, data structure that you saw, and you want to apply a BFT on that graph. So here is what you will end up having. You will begin, of course, with the root node A, and you will traverse. So it's kind of sort of a zigzag sort of uh, uh, structure. The gesture. So obviously, with when you apply a BFT to, to this graph, you will ultimately have to find J first, and then you could you would, then you would move on. Of course, according to depth. Now we found N, and you will continue O P Q. So here's the example, and that's the pseudocode. You can find a lot of explanations, a lot of uh, uh, literature that uh, relates to graph theory. Okay, weighted path length. Okay, let's skip that for now. So you can basically assign a function or a sort of a routine to associate a weight to uh, uh, a, a weight to uh, that, that that would be uh, end up uh, having to tra traverse uh, between a different uh, node to another another node. So right edge to the weight. Okay, let's skip that. So you can read a lot about it online. Here are just a couple of uh, examples. With a digraph, you can associate a cost factor or weight to, uh, to any path or to uh, any edge from uh, linking between any node to, uh, to another node. And with Oculus, I use this, uh, th th this sort of structure a lot, but of course with digraphs a lot. So that's uh, graph theory in general. Of course, if you have any questions, you can, you can ask uh, later, later on. And I'll show you the source code and uh, um, how I was able to uh, in implement graphs into incorporate graph, uh, graph theory into Oculus. So now comes the more interesting part, and that is graphics. How you would be able to render or visualize everything onto, on, on an iPad, for example. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the graphics API. So generally speaking, with uh, an uh, iOS, uh, uh, with the iOS, the current iOS architecture, uh, that also applies to iPhone and iPad or iPod Touch. You have four uh, main layers, and you can find this in the uh, the Apple developer documentation online. You can have the Cocoa Touch layer, 
uh, media layer, core services, and core OS. And my work involves a lot of uh, usage uh, and invocation to the different libraries that are under the media la layer. So I'll give, explain uh, a couple of things. So you can find, if you ever worked with programming before, you'll definitely come across a lot of these uh, libraries. If you're making applications, if you're an expert, then you're pretty, you're pretty much familiar with at least most of these libraries or uh, frameworks, built-in frameworks. Um, yeah. Uh, but with Oculus, I'm pretty much interested in these libraries and also more. So I basically involve OpenGL ES and GLKit as the, for, just to power up the, the drawing engine, as well as Cortex, which is something I haven't finished at the moment. I, uh, for example, I want to draw, for example, annotations or labels onto those nodes in either 2D and 3D, so I can basically also use Cortex as a library and also Accelerate to carry out advanced computations, for example. Okay, so that's... Uh, an overview of the architecture. Now I'm going to briefly talk a little bit about OpenGL. Uh, if you're new to OpenGL or OpenGL ES, um, it's basically, uh, basically the industry standard for high performance graphics. So uh, applications are endless. So we can basically make games, make any sort of visual application with ease these days usually using this library. Uh, of course this is on a Mac or desktop computers. You can also design uh, 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 design designing applications, for example, like AutoCAD. And, of course, I've had a previous attempt with Oculus. Uh, it, it was a Mac OS X uh, uh, or sort of a desktop application. Uh, the, the objective is to, for me, is to basically port that existing application into an, uh, a sort of a touch interface. And that, that's why I chose an iPad, because, I have, uh, because of the big, uh, big screen. And also, you can interact with the data more frequently, more with uh, means that aren't really possible with, uh, with current, current desktops. So you can basically use a mouse, for example, to select different nodes. However, you can also perform gestures as well and uh, different things. So you can, the possibilities are way more than, uh, than just uh, uh, designing a simple application on desktop. So what powers the graphics uh, in, uh, in uh, any iOS, uh, iOS device, uh, typically an iPad, is OpenGL ES. So it's similar, pretty much similar to, uh, to OpenGL, but it's designed for, uh, to, to run more efficiently and, on iOS devices. And it's really fast. Uh, and it, it, it's made up of a lot of feature set, a lot, a lot of features that would uh, enable you to, to power your um, uh, rendering mechanisms, like for example, the, the use of something called shaders. Uh, of course, this, this topic is way beyond the scope of this, uh, this talk, so if you're interested, you can still uh, look through the different tutorials online, different videos about OpenGL, OpenGLS. Yes. I'll just briefly explain how the, uh, I'm relating to, uh, to OpenGL ES and other libraries uh, with graph theory and how was, uh, I was able to uh, build the Oculus uh, at, at the current stage. So uh, I just briefly mentioned uh, OpenGL ES, so, and I use mostly GLKit instead of just OpenGL ES. So, if, you, uh, if you're familiar with shaders, you can pretty much guess that uh, it's, it's a little bit cumbersome. It's a little bit hard to kind of grasp it at the beginning, just to uh, apply certain patterns, certain, certain uh, uh, effects onto uh, your, your visualizations. But with GLKit, and it gave me a lot of power to, uh, I mean, uh, gave me a lot of, uh, actually saved a lot of time actually building uh, the, uh, uh, the major components of the application just by relying heavily on the on this library uh, on, on to GLKit. So, if you're familiar with GLKit, there are two main components uh, that that are existing in in, in the uh, in the in the the SDK. Uh, you can have a GLKit view. You can use that mainly to draw uh, your graphics, uh, either two D or three D. And these are just a couple of methods that are that you may find interesting into. Uh, that are part of uh, uh, a GLKit uh, subclass. Uh, you can have a display method uh, and a, a couple of other methods. Uh, I use the snapshot method a lot if you want to grab a current screenshot of the, of the visualization. I can save it as a PNG or any other format, and I will be able to ex uh, uh, export the, the current image and share it via uh, any other means, like via email or save it to a Dropbox folder and so forth, so that anybody else can see the, the uh, screenshot or locally to uh, the, the photos library within uh, an, an iPad, and yeah, you can share the results into a publication or so forth. You can just imagine. 
Okay, and also associated with the GLKit view is the GLKit view controller, and it's, it's really interesting to, to know that it also provides you with a lot of uh, ready methods or uh, utilities that, that would en enable you to, to control the f uh, how the visualization is uh, is maintained. Uh, you can, for example, configure how many frames per second the the current visualization is is going. And I'll just show you some stuff you made on. Skip that. Here's a. Uh, you can see this uh, pretty much the same methods that you would find in any UI kit, uh, UI uh, view controller class. Uh, also, come, uh, you can find them here at uh, uh, a part of GLKit view, GLKit view, view, view controller, as well as other properties and other other methods. So you can still read through the documentation and see those. Uh, the, th the things of our, our interest are some properties that you can set manually or leave by, by default, like for example, the preferred frames per second. You can control how fast your uh, animation goes for. So the default is 30, for example, and you can speed up the, uh, uh, the application or the rendering time to for 60, for example. So, okay, let's skip those. You can see everything online on the documentation. Uh, the other th other feature that's available in GLKit is the texture loader. Uh, Oculus now does not support uh, textures, so you can basically draw sprites, like points with different textures on them. You can make a transparent, you know, for example, glowing sort of uh, node or something. This, uh, and how you can do that, you can use the texture loader, the built-in uh, texture loader, um, to apply certain textures on, on your nodes or your edges, like, so for example, different patterns to distinguish, to, uh, for example, a, a line from another line. And the uh, third thing is, well, one of my favorites is the math library. And you can basically uh, perform a lot of computations, a lot of calculations using, using this uh, powerful set of libraries. And we have over, I guess it's way beyond four, uh, 200 math functions. That was last year. I'm not really sure about this year how many methods or how many functions you have. Of course, because we have also uh, OpenGL ES3, which was uh, just recently announced. But Oculus now only uses OpenGL ES2. I tried to upgrade uh, to use version 3 of OpenGL ES, but it, uh, it doesn't, uh, the code wasn't really compatible, I guess. So it's, uh, it's still an uh, uh, ongoing research. However, the maths library is pretty much as, as it is. I'll just give you some uh, hints about it. If you're familiar with drawing uh, or working with OpenGL ES, the previous versions are like version one point, and you want to, and you're a little bit familiar about shaders, or you work with shaders, uh, so you can basically uh, port your existing project into uh, something that works exactly the same as you would have uh, that would uh, run on uh, run using an OpenGL ES 2.0 or uh, using shaders without even using shaders. You can just basically use GLKit, and it will grant you the power of shaders, for example, like different uh, effects and so forth. So some of the, some of the ma mainstream things that I, I use a lot with uh, with Oculus, and that is vector calculations. Like for example, a distance between a different uh, or the the coordinates or the the length or path between any any given node or any given edge. So for example, you have uh, vector A and then vector B, and you want to see uh, or calculate the uh, the full length between uh, uh, for uh, vector R, the result, and it's straightforward. So these are. Uh, It's just a, just a simple example. And polar coordinates. And you would end up having 23.8 for, for uh, x, and y you'll have 25.8. OK, so how can you do that? So basically, if you have uh, in a, enabled the application to use uh, a GL kit, uh, you can simply invoke those uh, special functions. Uh, you can define, for example, vectors as uh, structures, and you can associate uh, for example, the result of having, like for example, vector A, uh, you can uh, uh, make a new vector out of a certain calculation. So you can have, uh, for example, uh, point X and point Y associated to vector A by, by um, incorporating a, or using a GLK vector to make function. And same thing with B, and you can also use another function which is called GLK vector to add. So you have a two-dimensional vector, and you wanna basically, uh, on, on the fly, calculate what's the, uh, uh, the end result of adding these two uh, polar uh, uh, the, uh, vectors so far. And yeah, you can end up have, by having the same results. You can print them uh, on a log, or you can actually see the results when you plot your uh, nodes uh, on t in 2D or 3D. So here's another example by calculating the length of a, of a given path. Okay, 
And of course, the fourth and final thing that, uh, that's related to GLKit, and that, that is the effects library. And I also use uh, the effects library as an example to apply different color schemes, different, uh, for example, uh, you can, uh, with Oculus, I supply a, a default color to all the, uh, the nodes, and I can, I can basically distinguish between a node, like for example, a root, root, uh, root node and a gold node by applying different colors. And uh, how to do that is by using uh, the, uh, the effects library. Okay, let's skip that. And in order to do, to do so, uh, I use a lot uh, the GLK base effects, and that is the simplest form of uh, uh, classes that, that are available uh, with, uh, within GLKit. And you can establish a simple sort of shader or a shader application that you would apply to, for example, all of your nodes. And when you, when you give it a, a certain color, if you, for example, if you specify a constant color to all nodes, just enable that only once, and you can copy it to uh, all the nodes and all the structures that you have, and yeah, you can have every, everything pretty much uh, laid out. Uh, there are many, many features, many other uh, usage, uh, usages of, uh, uh, of, the, of the effects library, but it's beyond the scope, of course, of this talk so far. So. Yeah, transformations, just mention that. So that's just briefly uh, an overview of the graphics API. And just a final word, just before we get into the source code and the uh, more in uh, interesting parts, and that is CSV parsing. So Oculus wasn't uh, going to reach into this stage unless I, uh, uh, a sort of uh, source for providing different data can be supplied. So. I came across this, uh, pro this interesting open source package on, on GitHub, which is called, uh, uh, developed by a person uh, by, by the name of Dave. And yeah, the source code is online. Uh, read through the documentation, I've uh, added that uh, component into Oculus, and I'm now able to basically do something like this, for example. Have different file formats, uh, mostly like in CSVs. Uh, I would do uh, some pre-processing and then post-processing and yeah, uh, I would end up having the results in the application, and I would think of a way of extracting the, uh, or exploring the results either visually on an iPad, and also uh, I'm also able to extract the uh, the results in also CSV and also different file formats using using that library. So these are just briefly the uh, key components that would make Oculus, and these are just the main delegate methods that you would normally call when you use the, this uh, special library. So, for example, parser did begin document and did end, and that's where you, you would specify, for example, if you have a, uh, arrays and stuff that you would save your data in, and it's really easy. It's an easy, straightforward. You can just use those uh, methods, write uh, all the important stuff uh, within those methods, and yeah, you can pretty much read and write and do some a lot of analysis in, while your application is running. So, okay, uh, enough of all the uh, theories. So uh, now I'm more than happy to show you the source code and how this application is built. Okay, so I'll explain all the inner workings, starting from the simplest element that the uh, the application uses. So, and that is a graphic. So I'll just explain something which is called a graphic delegate. Uh, if you're familiar, familiar with the, uh, the the term of uh, delegation within Objective C, you would see this uh, sort of mechanism easy and straightforward. So you would, for example have any sort of object, a simple representation, and you would give it a delegate, uh, assign it to a delegate, so you have a couple of methods that this uh, particular graphic or object would uh, implement later on. So uh, this method is pretty much uh, used a lot, or called a lot, and that is graphic with identifier. Every single structure, so you have uh, a graphic, which is the base, uh, base object, or uh, base class, sorry, that you would, uh, Create your either edges or nodes from, so we have something in uh, that is common. So every single structure that you have is made up of uh, of something that has an ID uh, identifier. So this ID can be anything. It can be a number, a weight, as mentioned before. It could be a string. It could be anything. So you can pretty much use uh, the identifier as as you wish. But within the uh, the current uh, uh, the de development stage, I'm using a lot of uh, strings as identifiers just to distinguish between, um, for example, a node and, its, uh, and other nodes, and from an edge to another edge, and from a graph with another graph. So, 
yeah, there are default uh, default values that are uh, set up, and there is a draw routine and a couple of other graphic related stuff. I'll just show you as well the graphic class. So as you can see, it's a little bit long. The reason why uh, it contains contains a lot of lines is that um, also with every single graphic structure, uh, there is uh, OpenGL, ES, and GLKit stuff associated with every single graphic. So you would normally use enable or disable or trigger uh, features within every single graphic object instance, regardless if it's, if it was an edge or a node. So I'll just show you here, for example. So can you see this? Okay. So you would have a graphic. So I'm, I'm just a quick note. This source code is going to be released online. So I'll be more than happy to share this whole project uh, under the uh, maybe possibly MIT license uh, later on once I finish the first the final uh, stage of Oculus. Uh, f you can feel free to download the, uh, the, app, the source code. You can play around with the application. Same as, as uh, Molecules. Molecules is pretty much an insp inspiration to me. And yeah, you can basically also contribute back. You can learn from the application. You can do whatever you want to do with the source code. I'm more than happy for contribution. And if you have any feedback, you can also ask. And also, you know, um, yeah, le also learn from, from things that are here. So the most important features are an ID or identifier that we distinguish between a node and or a graphic with an, another graphic. And a weight, and this is optional. If you want to establish a weighted uh, Structure, for example, a weighted graph, you would have to assign a weight factor to uh, to, to this graphic element, and you would enable uh, a trigger a drawable flag. You would uh, let's say if you want if you have that uh, node, for example, and if you don't want to draw it, then it's just a simple. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, triggering that, that boolean uh, value here. And okay, and we also have an associated graph, and it's just a basically weak reference, and because you have to associate. Uh, the relationship between this uh, simple structure with uh, any any graph, so it could be it could belong to a graph and could be uh, uh, and f uh, from that notation you can also uh, use the uh, or uh, employ uh, the traversal or searching uh, mechanism. And as you can see, here are a bunch of properties that are assigned to, to to this graphic, and most of them are you can see in orange color, and that these are. Um, GLK, GLK uh, structures, like for example, I'll just show you here, uh, the vertices that are associated, because for example, uh, here I'm using three, uh, three, you can see GLK vector three, I'm defining 3D. You may ask, okay, wh what about 2D? Uh, why are, uh, am I having 3D? So the current stage of Oculus supports both 2D and 3D. If you want to draw, uh, want to, for example, assign different vertices to uh, for example, to this this graphic, you would associate the z value as zero, and you could just basically assign uh, the x and y uh, values accordingly. Uh, the, uh, this this sort of stage has some some drawbacks, but uh, at the current stage, I do support by default three D, and the actual rendering is is done in three D. But if you want to draw in two D, you just basically forget about the z the z, the z factor or the, or the z value. You can also have color. Uh, color is comprised of RGBA, and that is red, green, blue, and alpha components, and vertex colors, and a position. So uh, I use a lot of vectors, for example, uh, a position vector where you can assign a location in either 2D or 3D to that uh, graphic, a velocity if you want to do some custom animation stuff, um, acceleration, scale, rotation, and some other stuff here. And of course, you can assign children. So if you have that graphic to be a root node, for example, so you can also save uh, different uh, 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 nodes to it as well. Or for sometimes if you want to do some complex animation to that particular node, then you would assign different children to, to, to that node. Uh, and you can see there are a couple of uh, creating stuff, uh, methods implemented, and some defaults that you can use throughout the application. And here is where you can invoke, for example, an update where if you're having, for example, 60 frames per second, so in each frame you would have to update that node, uh, regardless if it's a location or a different parameter, color, or whatever. So that get that method gets called a lot. Uh, draw and projection. Um, I forgot also to mention I'm, I'm using uh, the key term projection. So my current research involves uh, having to shrink down the dimensions. For example, having a 3D uh, uh, drawing of some sort of structure like a graph and the objective is to 
uh, go down from 3D to 2D, and sometimes from high dimensions, for, ex for example, uh, where data sets can have, for example, 15 or 20 dimensions or 100 dimensions, and the objective is to go down into something that you can see, and that is, uh, for example, in 2D and 3D. So I'm writing a lot of uh, uh, lines, a lot of algorithms, a lot of testing that involves projection. So whenever you see the key term projection, that, that also involves uh, an operation that is applied. So uh, it also involves uh, having to shrink down and po uh, do a lot of processing into those data sets and uh, ending up having uh, something that, is, uh, that can be represented in 2D and 3D. So, and you can see the source code is pretty long and whenever I create a new uh, graphic, so you can see defaults are constructed and so forth. I'll just show you what a node structure would look, li look like. I can have a node delegate, just show you that. Just a couple of parameters that, that you can assign and so forth. Node structure. Initializers as well. It's okay. I'll try to run the demo here if I can. I'll use the simulator. I'll just show you the current stage. So I'm building the application. It contains a lot of classes so far. So I've only just explained a couple of bits and pieces so far. And I'll show you the, the current stage. So it's running on a simulator, which I hope you can see. So within an iPad, for example, if you have portrait or landscape, um, you can have the number of frames per second visible on top. So I'm, I've selected 60 frames per second. And you have, with the application, the ability. So it, it's, not, it's not really complex. So with Oculus, you can have a simple screen or visualization that is by default empty. And you would have the ability to either generate, for example, random sets. Uh, for example, because I'm, I'm dealing with simple nodes, so I would, at this current stage, uh, I uh, do a, some investigation into generating random points. And I'll just basically specify how many points I want uh, Oculus to draw. Let's say I want to draw 10 nodes, and I would generate, and the application ends up having, there's a, like a lot of processing going in the, uh, in the background, and random coordinates are, are given. And of course, you can apply different uh, gestures, but I'm not able to do so here on the, on the, on the simulator. Uh, you can basically also select uh, the current data set. So basically, what happened is that when I selected uh, uh, to generate and also save into file uh, 10 nodes. What happened behind the scenes is uh, I'm able to generate uh, an associated CSV file which contains information about, about, that, uh, about those 10 nodes and as well a couple of other uh, files and a distance matrix. So the distance matrix is just basically a matrix that would uh, illustrate the, the weights or the distances between each node and so forth. And of course in a couple of other uh, uh, files as well. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is that you can also traverse. You can select which node. You can either tap on a node, or you can, from, from, the, from the simple pop-up, you can select, for example, a certain node. Uh, you can select maybe that one. Uh, you can search for different nodes within the data set, and so forth. And you can step, step through. You can go back through the visualization. You can draw lines. You can establish different relationships. The second stage of Oculus is to not just to be able to display something on the iPad, but you can go a step further, and that is you can do simulations and visualizations on the iPad and also use Apple TV, for example, to project uh, other, other uh, screens, uh, like, uh, for example, other cross sections. If, let's say if you have a visualization that, uh, in 3D and you want to see, for example, different sections, what sort of, uh, how the data is going to look like from a different angle, for example. And when you apply, uh, uh, for example, uh, Let's say if when, uh, during the visualization you would select a stage where you would select one node and you want to see how the result is going to look like from different angles, then you would see the main visualization appear on, on the first screen and you would have uh, the iPad uh, ha display other screens as well using, for example, Apple TV and you can see on a projector, you will see different information, like different cross sections and so forth. So it's, it's pretty much an ambitious project and I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, finishing this project as soon as possible. It is uh, part of my PhD work, uh, but yeah, like I said before, I'm really uh, happy to also listen to, to suggestions, and for I'm also looking forward to, for feedback from the community, from you guys, as well as anybody is interested into visualization or 
making pretty pretty pictures into using OpenGL or GLkit and so forth, or all about graphs in, in general. So yeah, so that's just a simple simulation here. Let's go back to slides. So that'll this brings me to the end of my talk so far. Uh, this is my contact information. Should you wish to contact me or if you ask, have any questions about my talk, uh, please do so. I'm on Twitter and Facebook. And if you want to send me an email, please use this email uh, because when I uh, finish my degree, I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be back at La Trobe uh, to, at Omar Khoury University. And yeah, I can use that email a lot. So thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. And yeah, if you have any feedback, please. That is a really good question. Uh, I have confronted this sort of issue with the Apple engineers last year. Unfortunately, I wasn't encouraged to incorporate core data, especially with saving such humongous files. Let's say, for example, if you have a data set that's way beyond 1,000 nodes. Um, I had some difficulty actually converting um, the uh, uh, vectors into something that is more meaningful, unless if you have any suggestions. I'm also uh, looking for suggestions. Like for example, you can transform, you can assign within core data a transfer transformable type. Uh, but I'm not really sure because I haven't done this before. Uh, with core data, it will actually speed up the process. It will make my life a lot easier. Uh, this current stage of Oculus does not support core data. But yes, in the future, both myself and Brad, Dr. Brad Larson, are uh, going to be changing our, the, the way the application is built, our, our, our uh, applications, both molecules and Oculus. And yeah, we will be super supporting core data because it is, a, it is a must. And I'm using core data in all of my applications so far. So yes, uh, there are plans, but currently not very, very soon. So yeah, and if I do have a solution or if I come across something that's interesting or a, a solution to or a new version of Oculus that would support core data, I will post it online. So, any questions? Ah. I've only tested so far until 100 or 200. Uh, the current implementation has a major weakness, and that is uh, of doing something that is really not practical, and that is, I did mention before something about uh, effects, and the, the downside of this current st uh, stage of the implementation is that I am associating uh, for every single node and every single edge an, uh, a new effect assigned to it. Of course, you would imagine having, for example, if you're familiar, if you're familiar with shaders, there's a lot of computation going on in the, back, in the background. So uh, at this stage, uh, every single node, let's say if you have 100 nodes, every single node, and you could also multiply like 100, and you can have many, many edges, of course. Let's imagine having a sparse graph. Every single element, every single graphic contains its own effect. And when you see that in memory, you can see it's actually consuming a lot of memory. And when I've done a couple of testing, it actually uh, slowed down the uh, rendering process from 60 frames per second into 12, and maybe beyond, uh, uh, sort of average 12 so far. So I will have to rewrite the, uh, the graphic structure again, and just to uh, only initialize one effect. And within that model, I would only copy and just uh, basically use that one effect uh, initialization and carry it across all the, all the nodes, for example. And one uh, effect that, that would be used associated with all the edges and so forth. So, yeah. So, it, at the current stage, it does have a couple of uh, limitations with, when it comes to uh, visual, visualiz uh, visualization power. So, yeah. Any questions? So, thanks a lot, and I really hope you enjoyed. And yeah, I'm going to be uh, around, so if you have any questions later on, please feel free to contact me. And, yeah. Thanks a lot.